guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I'm Sherilyn. If this isn't your first time here, then welcome back. Thank you guys so much for the support. It means everything to me. I hope the hat isn't too distracting today. We'll see. Today it's necessary because my grays are coming through Oh my god, like I can't keep up with them. I just didn't want a root spray today It's all I've been doing every time I film and then I find it just gets all chalky and bleh. it's a whole thing Anyways, we're, we're 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 working with the hat today, and I hope that's okay with you guys I feel like it also kind of fits this little 90s vibe that I'm going for I'm a hero. And this is what happens when you have to film a video on a time crunch and you have a three-year-old I'm going to jump right into today's case because it is a long one. There's lots to cover This is a case that completely messed me up from the get-go. I remember watching her first interview on 48 hours before she had even gone to trial. <laughs> and I remember watching it kind of being like, I, I don't believe her because she just gave off that vibe of just whack job. But she believes herself so much that you're like, Okay, did it happen the way she's saying it? So I really wanted to get to the bottom of, was this just this relationship that kind of did this to Jodi? Has she always been manipulative like this? And just really find out as much as I could while also going through the relationship between Jodi and Travis and the events that led up to his death. If you haven't heard of Jodi Arias, she is a woman from Arizona who is currently serving a life sentence for the murder of her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. Travis was born on July 20. 28th, 1977 in Riverside, California. Travis was very open and shared a lot of his childhood and it was it was really sad. He and his seven siblings grew up to drug addicted parents so they were just unable to care for and provide for the children like they needed and deserved. And it's really heartbreaking to hear him talk about his parents because even if your parents have done wrong, there's this battle within you to try to see that good. And when Travis talks about them, it's kind of the, the vibe that I get. He says that his dad was very absent and it was his mom that was at the home all the time but she would go days where she would go on drug benders and then sleep. In a blog that he wrote he shared that his siblings often went without food. When there was food it would get to the point that it would expire and that was all that was left to eat so they often ate rotten food. He said that if they would wake their mother up for food or things that they needed it was often met with a beating and he just learned how to position his body so that any contact that she was making with him would hurt less. He also shared that one of their homes was so infested with cockroaches that him and his sister said it used to look like salt and pepper was just moving all over the floor because that's how much there was and that it was very common for him to wake up in cockroaches on his bed. Eventually, his family moved from that house and into a camper. Keep in mind that you've got eight children and this was set up in one of his aunt's backyards near the garage so that they could have water connected to it. He said in those early years, he had a really, really hard time making friends. He said, being brought up in that lifestyle, you didn't have the luxury of being bathed every night by your parents. He didn't have nice clothes. So he said being the smelly kid in class was hard for him to make relationships. He writes that his only solace around that time is that him and his sister always look forward to watching Sesame Street together and they love to go in and visit their great grandfather. It sounds like this man had quite an influence on everybody in his life. Travis's mom loved and respected him so much that when she would go and visit and bring the kids, she would try to do herself up and just show that she was doing well in life. She didn't want him to know that she was struggling or the lifestyle that she had got caught up in. And it's this man who had a big influence on Travis's life and he just remembered every time he saw him he would grab him by the face and tell him he could be anything he wanted to be and when Travis spoke of success later on in his life you can tell that is the mantra he kind of carried throughout so at 10 years old he had had enough of the way that he was living and he couldn't take it anymore so he ended up running away from home and going to his grandmother's house his grandma eventually took in all eight children and she was a really really big follower of the Mormon faith so that was something that she wanted the kids to become very active in. All of Travis's siblings, they accredit their amazing upbringing from that point forward in their lives to their grandma. They all affectionately called her 
her mum mum. She just sounds like the absolute sweetest and she's the one who just gave them this new lease on life. And the main pillar of that was the church. So that's where Travis started to build really strong bonds. He was able to make friends there and the church was a huge, huge part of his everyday life. Because of his younger years, he promised to himself he was never going to live that way again. He was determined to be very successful. When he was able to get a job, oftentimes he had three jobs at a time so that he could buy the things that he wanted in life. And he meets a man who introduces him to a company called Prepaid Legal. Essentially what it is, is it's like an MLM structure business where you recruit people to join your team and you sell legal insurance. So Travis saw how successful his team leader was and he was like, I'm gonna get there. And that's what he did. He became one of the top earners. He often spoke at a lot of conventions. He even sold a policy to the guy who was Barney. <laughs> And he was just really, really loved and respected in that industry. One of the really sweet things about him is that he was always about paying it forward, not only just because of the way that he grew up and saw that what can happen when people go without or what can happen when you grow up in a drug addicted family, but he also had a, what he felt was a near death experience. He and his friend were at a cafe one day and a gunman ended up coming in to rob the place. It sounds like him and his friend were trying to shuffle over to another area Area and the gunman saw him, went over to him, held a gun to his head and told him to give him his wallet. Travis said he didn't have a wallet on him that day. So as he's screaming at him, demanding a wallet that he doesn't have, he's like, this is it, my life is over. And somebody slides their wallet across the floor to him. It sounds like the guy that was robbing the place took it, went and grabbed a couple more and then left. But that moment and that act from that stranger stuck with him. So he would try to help and share and give everything he could. Another part of his energy that people would talk about is just his, was his charisma. He always wanted to make people laugh. He even created this alter ego called Ed Snell and this guy was an arrogant douchebag. <laughs> He'd even have this alter ego come out when he would do these conventions and presentations as like what not to do in life or how not to be a salesman. He just knew how to make people laugh. He was also a very well-known flirt. He loved the ladies. He liked to date. And Travis was 30. If you're 30 and you're not married in the morning, Mormon church, you're walking around with like a sign on your forehead, just blinking, unmarried, no kids single. It's just very rare that that happens, but it sounds like he was wanting to find the right lady. He didn't want to settle. He wanted somebody who saw how hard he worked and to appreciate that and to have that same drive and the same passion as him. Everybody knew he was on the prowl looking for his wife and that's essentially how he met Jody. Jody grew up very different than Travis. She was born on July 9th, 1980 in Salinas, California and her parents Sandra and William Arias had four children. She was the oldest and her father William had an older daughter prior to his relationship with Sandra. So Jody also had a half sibling. Jody's accounts of her childhood have changed throughout the years. Um, originally she said it was very, very typical. She had a loving family, nothing traumatic, most certainly nothing like Travis had to deal with in his childhood. But over the years that's changed a little. Jody said that it was typical until about age seven and then at that point, her parents would punish her for doing things she wasn't supposed to and they would use wooden spoons or belts. And I mean, she was born in the very early 80s and I don't know how old you are watching, but I'm born in 86 and I can't say that I ever got the belt, but I, think I was told about the belt. My parents would be like, this is how I was punished. Do you want that? And I'd be like, no, I don't. But I mean, if you acted a fool, you, you got smacked on your it's not something that you can come back later and be like, oh, I, I've done something terrible and it's because I got spanked when I was a shit. So that's the latest accounts of how her early years were. Around the age of 10, she got her first camera and grew a really big passion for photography. That's something that stuck with her into her adult years. It's a passion that over the years, she was always trying to grow. And what's kind of cryptic about the whole camera, it's a camera that ultimately leads to investigators discovering how and when Travis Alexander died. Jody said that in school, she didn't have too many friends. She was quite quiet and shy. She said her family 
family moved a lot, so it was hard for her to tell how long they were gonna be somewhere and made it difficult for her to form really lasting bonds. When she was 14, her family moved to Wairika. Wairika, anyways. She went to a Wairika Union High School and in grade 11, she ended up dropping out. She was battling a lot with her family. She was getting caught doing things she wasn't supposed to, like growing pot on their roof. But Jody's tactic for when she was getting in trouble was to deflect from the situation and just go berserk. She would become physical to her parents. She would scream and throw massive tantrums. She would threaten suicide. And she didn't just do this with her parents. There have been a couple times where old friends of hers would call her parents and she'd be in the middle of a meltdown at their house. And they're like, something's wrong with her. She needs to get help. I think that is a form of manipulation from Jodi Arias. I would assume that she probably learned very early on that if she threw a tantrum, she got her way. And then as she got older, that manipulation became more deceitful and it just grew to bigger extremes. Jodi also had a string of boyfriends around this time and she's the kind of person who within whatever relationship she would enter, she would morph into that person. So there would be people that she was interested in who were interested in the Buddhist culture. So she would start to study that and become interested in that and become that person that that particular boyfriend or guy she was interested wanted. When Jodi was 17, she ended up leaving home and she said it was after a physical altercation with her mom. She ended up moving in with an on and off boyfriend named Bobby Juarez and he lived with his grandmother and the house is described as kind of dilapidated but in her mind at that time she just thought that was a better situation for her. Bobby is described as quite eccentric. He was interested in vampires and stuff. They had an on and off relationship. She claims that he was physically abusive sometimes to her and that he also cheated on her. So there does come a point for Jody where she's had enough of it and she decides to move out of Bobby and his grandmother's house but instead of going back home she decides to to go and live with her grandparents. She then dates a gentleman named Matt and her and Matt had a very, very close relationship. In fact, to this day, they still communicate as far as I know. He was a very strong supporter of hers during her trial. But as routine goes with her, she ends up leaving him because he's cheated on her. And at that point, she ends up leaving and moving to Big Sur, California. And she gets a job as a waitress at Venita Inn and Spa. And this is described as kind of like a boutique hotel. And they've got in-staff housing. When she first gets hired, she gets hired by the manager that's there named Daryl Brewer. And he said that he had no complaints about Jody. Jody was a great employee and he was her manager for about two years. And then he decided to step down from that position and just become a server. Daryl was quite a bit older than Jody. He had recently gone through a divorce and he had a son, but they had a good friendship. And about two years after him working there, him and Jody decided to form a relationship. Things were going great in their relationship. Eventually they end up buying a house together and he says that that living situation is quite idyllic. She gets along really well with his son. He, she doesn't take on like a mother role, but almost like a big sister friend, somebody that he can rely on. She would often take him on little outings, the two of them, and spend time with him. And they seem to have a really close relationship. During this time, the house they bought is in Palm Desert. So Jody's no longer working at that hotel that they met at, but she does continue to have a couple serving jobs and she's trying to get her photography business going. And so her and Daryl have been together for about four years and in that fourth year one of her part-time jobs is at a pizza parlor. I either call it a pizza joint or a pizza parlor. It's never a pizza restaurant. I don't know why but she's working at a pizza restaurant and her boss there ends up asking her if she's interested in coming to hear a presentation about the side business he has going on and it's a really good opportunity that she could probably make a lot of money. So Jody is like hell yeah I'm working a few jobs. I'll check it out. And this is a seminar for prepaid legal. So that's the company that Travis Alexander is very successful in. So my understanding is her boss is one of the team members of a gentleman named Chris Hughes. And Chris Hughes is very, very good friends with Travis. And so Jody goes and sees one of these talks. She decides to join the company. And part of the foundation of these companies is these conventions. It sounds like Jody liked going to these. I think they kept, kept her engaged in the company. She wasn't that good at it, but she, I think, saw potential. So she ends up going to 
one of these conventions in September 2006 and this one is in Las Vegas and this one it sounds like a lot of those top guys are there and it's a really really big one and it's here that Chris Hughes ends up going to Travis and saying hey listen there is a girl that's on our team she's new she seems to be jazzed about the company she's really good looking I, I think you should meet her and that was it that was the first meeting of Jody and, and Travis by both accounts there was a spark and an initial attraction right off the hop they ended up talking the entire night that first meeting and the next day there was a ball style dinner for top earners so Travis was going to this Jody wasn't at that point in her business yet but he asked if she wanted to be his date and accompany him it was really fancy so he asked if she had a dress and she didn't so he was like listen hold on a second I think I can sort this out I think we can find something for you I want you to come so he contacts Chris's wife who's also at the convention and he asks if she happens to have something extra and she did so Travis comes with this dress for her to borrow and she's his date for this dinner on that second night of them meeting and so for her she describes it as that fairy tale it was you know that Cinderella moment she's going to the ball she's got this dress this great guy and I think from that point forward she just thought that meeting was just so romantic and significant she thought she was going to be with him forever keep in mind Jody's got Daryl still at home now her version of that time event does not add up with Daryl's at all she says that after that meeting with Travis she went home and ended things with him and it's just that's not the case when he speaks about certain events those timelines and those months don't add up and I think that it's just important to get out there right now because throughout the story you're gonna see a lot of Travis his actions that I think people who support Jody really really hammer him for and I'm not saying he always made the best decisions I'm not saying he didn't lead Jody on or anything but I just I think it's important to know that at the beginning of their encounter and for quite a few months into it Jody was doing things behind Daryl's back and then later tried to act like she had ended things with him and she didn't so Jody comes back from that convention and Daryl says pretty early on he sees a shift in her she She's changing into somebody that he doesn't recognize anymore. She's becoming quite irresponsible. She is slacking on bills that she's responsible for paying for the house. And meanwhile, we know it's because she's spending up pretty much her entire day talking, communicating with Travis. Now, Jody and Travis didn't live close to each other. He was in Mesa and she was in Palm Desert. So what they would do is they would meet in the middle at Chris Hughes' house, who is Travis's friend, Jody's team leader, you know. And they would spend the weekend there hanging out with the Hugheses. Jody says within a week of them meeting, they had their first sexual encounter. And being of Mormon faith, sexual activity is a big no-no, especially sex. You don't have sex before marriage within the Mormon church. I think that's why they get married so young because it's like anything, I think even impure thoughts are, if you're very, very devout, are a sin. So it's almost like they're like, hey, let's get married so I don't go to hell because I don't want to think about this anymore. I'm sorry if that sounds insensitive, but that's just the general vibe that I get from reading about the religion. So although Travis was so active in his church, he wasn't a perfect Mormon. It didn't take away his beliefs though. It didn't take away from the fact that he still wanted to marry a Mormon woman. So what Travis does is he starts introducing that faith to Jody and Jody being Jody, who's going to jump on any bandwagon to please the guy she's interested in, starts diving into the Mormon faith. Travis sends missionaries over to her house so she would have people come to the house and teach her the Book of Mormon. They would pray with her and Daryl started to see even more new changes in Jody specifically revolving around this religion. He said that as she was learning about the faith in those early stages, she just came to him one day and said, we are no longer going to be able to be intimate. So Daryl was like, okay. Also keep in mind, I don't think Jody wanted to marry Daryl like, at this point. It was already very clear and set out in the relationship that he wasn't interested in remarrying again. But I think in the back of Jody's mind, it was like, okay, well, now I'm taking this away. So there's really not much more to the relationship because I'm saying I don't want to have sex until I'm getting married. And she knows that Daryl doesn't want to marry her. It's almost like she's wanting him to end the relationship and not her. Maybe that would make her feel a little bit better about the fact that every other weekend she's going to friends' houses and meeting with Travis and getting 
getting busy with him. I don't know. I wasn't there. And early on when they're having those visits, Travis's friends really, really love Jody. They almost to the point where they're kind of unsure because she's so nice that they're like, how is she real? She's perfect. You have to marry her. She's amazing. We know now Jody knows how to manipulate. So I think that was part of the tactic, you know, be this very sweet, soft-spoken, gentle woman for Travis. She's walking around with the Book of Mormon. Anytime Travis is around, she's got this book glued to her. She also starts taking some of Travis's favorite motivational quotes and putting them on her MySpace. So it's like, oh, look at all the stuff we have in common. You like that quote? So do I. <laughs> I think that's easier for a woman to see than a man. So Travis just thinks she probably could be the perfect girl. Like I said, they since they lived far away, the majority of their relationship was communicating over the phone or text or email. Throughout the year and a half that they knew each other, they exchanged 82,000 emails. And so in the beginning of November 2006, Jody says she could feel that Travis was kind of pulling away a little bit. He wasn't as quick to respond or messaging as often. So she felt like she was losing his interest. So what does Jody do? <laughs> Jody decides that to gain that back and, you know, reel him back in, she wants to convert and become a Mormon. She wants to get baptized. And not only that, she wants him to do it. Travis is really excited. He's honored that Jody's asked him to baptize her. So on November 26, 2006, Jody gets baptized into the Mormon faith and Travis is right there beside her supporting her. Now I found this interesting reading about this as well. So I guess she also invited her parents to come and watch her baptism as well as Daryl. Both parties declined. Her parents felt like it was just such a rash decision. She had just started learning about this and they weren't understanding what the haste was. And I'm not sure why, but Daryl didn't end up going either. I'm sure it's because he thought in his mind, it was this reason why she was pulling back and it wasn't because of Travis. He didn't know about Travis and that relationship at that time. But I just thought that would have been really awkward if he did, you know, if he thought he wanted to save things with Jody and support her. But anyways, apparently the tactic worked because it started to drive her and Travis closer again. So in December, 2006, uh, Daryl and Jody end up ending their relationship. And he says it was more of just a conversation. It was never really very clear that it was completely ended. It was more of a parting and it was just kind of left open and uncertain. On Jody's end, that gave her fuel to just go pedal to the metal with Travis. And then people start seeing just a side to Jody that they don't really want for Travis. She's becoming essentially a stage five clinger. Wherever Travis is, Jody's right there. And if Travis is off talking to somebody, specifically a female, you can see Jody standing and just staring and burning holes through this woman's eyes. Just really, really possessive. And she's wanting a push to become official. And it sounds like Jody's not scared or shy to talk about that either. She's very outspoken with his friends and, and so says, you know, why won't he commit to me? I like him so much. I'm doing all of the things he likes. We act like boyfriend and girlfriend. It's almost like he's leading me on. I just want to become official and he's really messing with my emotions. And it gets to the point where his friends almost start to feel sorry for Jody and get a little bit upset and frustrated with Travis. They're like, you know, what's the point? Why do you keep leading her on? This isn't right. It's not really fair to her. You need to make a decision, either commit to her or don't. Travis just wasn't ready at that time though. And he said he had been making it very clear saying, you know, if she's not comfortable with us just dating and hanging out and spending time together, I've told her to date other people. I'm not willing to commit at this point. I don't know what I want and I'm not locking her down. She's very free to go and date who she wants. So Jody would go and date people within this prepaid legal business. So it, obviously she knew it was going to get back to Travis and then she would talk about it with Travis's friends hoping that it would make him jealous in some way. So although Jody is going on these other dates, she's still maintaining contact with Travis. And I think that her intention was that once he would hear about her going out with other guys, he would instantly change his mind because she would, what I believe, make up conversations 
conversations and emails and texts basically saying that she was just the perfect woman and forget about Travis, he doesn't deserve you. But then she would share this with Travis. I can't really tell you why, but they did maintain a friendship and physical relationship despite the fact that there were a lot of red flags and obsessive behavior. She even admitted that around this time when they weren't in a relationship, she would go through his emails and see who he was communicating with and then send the emails to herself so she had copies of it. So despite her saying to people, you know, I'm trying to move on and he's getting jealous and he's not letting me, I don't buy that for a second. That's what she wanted people to see. And it did essentially work because his friends did basically tell him, you know, get off the pot. Obviously like her, if that's the case, then just date her and see where it goes. So in February 2007, that's what he does. He commits to Jody and they become a fish. And you know, that that should be enough for Jody just in those early stages and just that initial commitment. But no, off the hop, Jody's ready to just go full blown into this thing. And she's trying to get really serious really, really fast. Remember, they're long distance, so they don't get to see each other every day. And you know, poor Travis, because I think he tried to make make an effort and show Jody his interest and include her in things that he wanted to do. So he ends up buying this book and it's called A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. And a big part of their relationship, especially in those very early days, was going and traveling together and seeing some of these spots and checking them off the list. So they're building an even tighter bond. But for Jody, I think that that was dangerous because she's making these memories with him and it is something to hold on even tighter. Whereas I think for Travis, it's like, she was a companion and he wanted to see these places and he's glad someone wants to go and see them with him. For her, it's like we're building these memories to like look back and show our grandchildren one day. So despite the official label of their relationship, Jody's still really insecure. She wants Travis to shout it from the rooftops that they're in a relationship. Anytime they are in a public setting, she gets upset if he does not introduce her as my girlfriend Jody. If he says, hey, Bob, this is Jody. She's offended. If she introduces herself, she'll go, hi, I'm I'm Travis's girlfriend. I'm Jody. Like I said, Travis is a very charismatic guy. Jody was so insecure that if he was in a conversation with somebody, she would just walk right up and just like stand there and be glued to him and stare. A reoccurring observation from people is that especially in public settings, she was really uncomfortable that she couldn't have Travis all to herself. So it became clear really early on that her ultimate goal was to move to Mesa and be really close to Travis. What she was wanting was she was wanting that validation. She was wanting him to say, I want you to move here. I want you to be with me. And he wasn't doing it. So what Jody decides to do is she makes a fake email account and emails herself. And the email essentially reads that this person really loves Jody. They don't know why she's with Travis. She could do so much better. And with Travis being so far away, he couldn't protect her. So it was almost like she had this stalker that was going to be coming for her and since Travis lives so far away he couldn't protect her. So Travis shows this email to Chris's wife and she just starts laughing. She's like okay no 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 no. And Travis is kind of offended like she's really scared. This is really creepy. Read that. And his friend's like Travis honey she wrote this email. This is her attempt of getting you to ask her to move to Mesa so it looks like you want her there and not her just inviting herself to come and live here. At this point they start really cluing in on these red flags even more than they were. Initially there were things that kind of made them uncomfortable about Jody, like she would be awkwardly affectionate towards Travis in front of them. She would even show up to their house just to talk about Travis sometimes. As the behavior started to get increasingly more aggressive they started to pull away from her a little bit. So on one specific visit they're just getting all weird vibes from Jody. She's not letting Travis go to the bathroom without her just standing outside the door waiting for him. They just pull Travis aside when Jody went to bed one of the nights and they're like listen something's not right it's it's really off and this is starting to get a little bit scary and initially Travis is a little bit offended he's like she's great what do you mean you've been telling me also to commit to her and things are going really well I'm not seeing what you're seeing and so they bring up some of those things that he's obviously a little bit blinded to and as they're talking 
there's a knock on the door. And so Travis opens the door and Jody's standing there. And he's like, yes, hello. And Jody looks pissed. Like she's livid. And she just says, well, what time are you going to bed? Remember, they are leading everybody to believe that they are living a very Mormon lifestyle. So nobody knows that they are having a sexual relationship behind the scenes. So they're sleeping in separate bedrooms. And he's like, oh, I'll be going in a little bit. I'm just having conversation. Just go back to your room. I'll see if you're awake when I'm going to bed and say goodnight to you. So she's really upset that he's told her to leave, but she says, okay, and goes back to her room. So they continue their conversation, which probably was a little bit awkward for Travis who was just defending her. And then he's like, oh, okay, yeah, awkward. You know, and they're sitting there looking at him like, Bro, that kind of even feels it a little bit more where his friends are like, look it, this is just gonna get more intense. This isn't gonna get better. We're really worried for you. This isn't just about us being like, oh, I don't think you're right for each other. This is about, and I quote, us being worried that we're gonna find you in her freezer. While they're having this conversation, Chris's wife just gets this weird feeling over her and she's like, I think she's back out there. And they're like, no. So Travis just quietly walks to the door and flings it open fast and sure as shit Jody's just standing outside the door looking like she's about to blow the place up. At this point his friends had had enough. They said they felt so uncomfortable that night they actually wanted her to just leave right then and there. However for Travis they let her stay but didn't even sleep. They didn't even want their kids in the house and slept with them that night. In the morning Chris's wife has a conversation with Jody and she just lays it all out there. She says you listen you and Travis Travis can't have this spot as your meeting grounds anymore. I don't want you in my house. I'm seeing things that are making me really uncomfortable and I just don't want to be a part of it. And Jody starts bawling and her only question is not, you know, what can I do to make this better? I'm so sorry you feel this way. I didn't mean to come across like this. She just says, are you going to tell Travis he shouldn't date me anymore? And his friend was like, I already did tell him that. And then she said Jody just fell apart. And that was the last time that she ever had Jody in her house. After that meeting though, for a little while, Travis is still seeing this side to Jody that he is really intrigued in and loves. And so instead of meeting up at the Hughes' house, they continue meeting up to spend time with each other in different areas in this book so that they can also cross off more spots to see on this list. Jody had already admitted that prior to them even being in a relationship, she'd gone through his phone and his emails. And she continued to do that throughout their relationship. And in June 2007, she goes through Travis's email and she sees that he is communicating with other women and it's not what you would want your boyfriend to be doing. He's having inappropriate conversations with other ladies and Jodi is taking it as, as him cheating on her. The day she finds this, they're actually supposed to go and cross off another bucket list place to see. So she doesn't say anything to him. She still wants to go and do this with Travis and she does. And then when they get back, Back, she lets him know that she saw the email and at that point they decide to mutually end their relationship. They haven't completely cut off contact though. They still communicate with each other here and there. And two weeks after they end things, Jody decides to move to Mesa. So Travis finds out that she's moving there and he's not happy about it at all. He knows that the only reason she's going there is for him. She doesn't have family out there. She doesn't have a job out there. There's no reason for her to be in Mesa yet she's forging on and going to Mesa. Even though he's not happy about it, like I mentioned before, Travis liked to take care of people. He wanted to give when he could. So he wasn't just gonna completely isolate Jody. She didn't have a lot of money, so he did what he could where he could. He ended up hiring her to come and clean his house a couple times a month, and he gave her money for that. He also would invite Jody over if he was having friends over because he knew she didn't really have any out there. But Jody took full advantage of it. His friends would say that Travis never really locked his door. Everybody knew that. So she would just walk in unannounced and uninvited. There were times Travis told his friends that she would sometimes get in the house in the dog door if the door was locked and then she would just wait for him in his bedroom. Some days this would cause Travis to get really upset and then unfortunately some days he just caved to the temptation. But as always, Travis is looking for his wife and the wife he's looking for is, is not only Mormon, but she's a virgin. And the more Jody is putting herself out there thinking she's doing what he wants, the more she is just reiterating to him that she's not the woman for him. In July 2007, Travis starts pursuing a relationship with a woman named Lisa and she checks off 
all the boxes that he's, you know, looking for for his wife. And here you can kind of see a little bit of a struggle with Travis because he obviously is not wanting to do anything to spoil that reputation. He's making sure that that image of her and their relationship is very pure. So he's got his thing with Lisa and then he also maintains contact with Jody, so he can have this other side of him and continue to fulfill those needs and it's almost like until he's ready to, you know, officially commit with Lisa and put a ring on it and lock her down and then eventually have the relationship with her. So he's got these two women going and he's explaining to both of them that they're just friends. So Lisa's obviously seeing that there's a lot of times where they're, they're hanging out and Jody shows up. And he's also still exploring some of these places from this book and instead of bringing Lisa, who he's now pursuing, he still brings Jody. So Jody's also believing that Lisa's just a friend and one night when Jody just, you know, randomly decides to show up to Travis's house, instead of going through the front door, she says she went through the back and just happened to catch a glimpse into the house through the window. So she just goes to the window instead of going in the house and just starts looking through the window. You can't manipulate me. You were straight up stalking. She's a freaking peeping Tom. So she's stalking Travis one night and she says she sees two people sitting on the couch and she's not really sure who they are because they are making out. So she can't see their face, but she just keeps watching as one does. Then she eventually sees that it's Travis. So she doesn't say anything. She doesn't go in that night. She goes back home and the next day, an anonymous email is written to Travis's girlfriend. And basically in it, it's just completely ripping her apart. This person is calling her a whore. They're saying she's gonna be punished by her God and have to explain for her sins. How can you sleep at night? Saying that you are a devout Mormon when you act this way. And so she's really freaked out. And at this point, Travis is, I don't think he wanted to admit that it was Jody. He was unsure. Some of his friends were like, do you think it was Jody? And he he didn't really wanna say. But then it seemed that every time either Lisa was at his house or he was at Lisa's house, something would go down. Sometimes there would be a knock on the door and when they went there, no one was there. Or they'd hear a rustling outside the window. There was a time that Travis's tires were slashed. So then he started to finally accept that, yeah, this this probably is Jody. Eventually, Lisa ends up breaking things off with Travis. I'm sure this probably had a little bit to do with it, but she also said that it's because Travis seemed to be really ready for marriage and she wasn't quite there yet, so she didn't want to lead him on. And so same song and dance, he continues to still keep in contact with Jody despite her doing questionable things. And he's also still trying to save that relationship with Lisa and keep in contact with her. I just feel for him so bad because it's his world just kind of started to slowly crumble around him. As an outsider looking in, it's obvious, you know, that it's it's just that toxic relationship that he has with Jody and how bad it is, but he he just wasn't able to see it. And so going into 2008 for him, it was quite the struggle. You could see, especially in his blog, that he was really starting to reflect on that past year and it wasn't where he wanted to be and it wasn't the path that he wanted to continue on. He wrote that he really wanted to focus a lot on his business, focus on relationships and making them priority for marriage and not just to date without so many words, it's almost like, hey, this has been a whirlwind this past year since I met this broad. I need to reset, refocus, and these are my intentions. I read the blog and it's really difficult to read sometimes because you realize you know what happened to him in the in the end and it almost sounds like he was just clawing his way out of this toxic hole that he had and that he really wanted to free himself, but he didn't know how. And in the same sense, it's almost like he knew what was coming. There were all these preparations for things that he wanted to see before he died. He had this self-reflection of his life up until this point and really started to analyze himself and what he wanted to change to make himself better moving forward. If you wanna read it, it's called Travis Alexander Being Better Blog. It is really, really crazy to read his words. So Travis mentions in there that he's wanting to date from this point forward forward with marriage in mind. And so he kind of starts to look a little bit more seriously at possible candidates for this position at church. And there's a girl that he meets there named Mimi and he's really, really interested in her. She's quite a bit younger than him, but she's got everything that he's looking for. And so he asks Mimi if they can go on a date. And so she agrees to go on a first date with him. And Travis said it was a little bit uncomfortable. He wasn't sure how to read her. I think she kind of had a guard up and Travis wasn't able to be his charismatic 
dramatic self. I would assume too that he was probably feeling a little bit deflated. I can only imagine what a year dealing with that level of crazy from Jody would have done to somebody's self-esteem and emotions. So he had almost kind of lost his mojo on this date and Mimi leaves the date and you know contacts him later and she's like you know I think that maybe we just be friends. And so Travis is a little bit bummed out about it but he's like yeah okay. And so you see this kind of pattern where it's almost like if his ego is a little bit bruised he'll contact Jody and kind of re-spark things a little bit with her. As things go with these toxic situations though they did argue a lot and the relationship was just very clearly becoming less friendly and flirtatious and more just there's one specific purpose for any meetings or encounters we had and those were purely sexual. Around this time there is an announcement that there's going to be a all-inclusive vacation for top earners in the prepaid legal business and so Travis being one of them he won this trip to go to Cancun. He had told friends that he wished he could bring Mimi but she had you know pushed back and friend zoned him so he wasn't sure if he'd ever get out of that and didn't just want to come out and be like hey do you want to go on a trip with me? So at one point in time Travis had asked Jody to accompany him on this trip. My understanding of it is it was very brief because they were arguing a lot and I think Jody could just tell that that relationship was just slipping further and further away and there was no repairing it. So in April 2008, she decides that she's gonna move back to Yreka. Oh, I said Yreka good. Travis's friends say after she left, there was this huge weight lifted off of his chest. It's almost like he could finally just breathe and he was done with her and not have to worry constantly look over his shoulder or have that temptation so so close. So she moves back in with her grandparents and she ends up getting a job at a Mexican restaurant and then she's still trying to on the sidelines get this photography thing going for her as well. It's actually the time that Travis actually publishes on his blogs the writings that he had had at the beginning of the year. I think his intention initially was to start writing a book about his life and for whatever reason reason in April that's when he started to just share it and get it out there at that point instead of waiting for a publishing deal and it's like one of those moments again where there must have been this feeling in him that was like I don't know if I'm ever going to get a book out but I do want to share some of this so I'm going to put this out there now and that's where Jody's able to read some of his thoughts and I don't think that those were easy for her because it's essentially saying you know what a gong show my life has been lately and I don't want to date just to date I want a date to marry and that's not who I'm attracting these days. So Jody sees this blog and she decides to start her own and it's it's just another cringy thing you can add to the list of things that she's done. It's so similar to Travis's so you can tell you know with every entry she's got a goal in mind and it's to try to make them similar whether that's to save face and be like yeah I know I also am doing a lot of self-reflecting so you or if it's like see we still have so much in common we should be together because she's morphing into him still but Jody, she I don't think she really gave a shit she just she's got no shame not long after these blogs start she also starts to show interest in another gentleman and he's also part of this prepaid legal business and he is quite similar to Travis he's good looking he's very successful in the business and in fact he attributes a lot of his success to Travis because he said when he first started this business he wasn't really doing that well and then he went to a conference and heard Travis speak and when he heard Travis's story and saw his passion and his drive and learned some of the tools that Travis had he applied them and he became really successful he's also a Mormon so perfect for Jody. she doesn't need to learn another religion she's on that one right now so she's ready to go I'm not too sure if Travis ever heard about that relationship if he did it seems like he didn't really care he was still pursuing things with Mimi and and wanting something to blossom there and he actually ended up asking her to come along to Cancun with him and no pressure no strings attached just come as friends and they could stay in separate rooms he said he needed to make a decision and put somebody on that final itinerary and he really wanted her to come so she decides she's gonna go to Cancun and then it sounds like Travis ends up contacting Jody. I don't know if he you know just kind of nonchalantly slipped it in there like hey you're not coming to Cancun anymore and Travis's friend said you know initially Jody was a little bit
bit upset, but she, what are you going to do? It's not like she was paying for the trip. She didn't really have a leg to stand on when it came to who he could take or couldn't, but she did ask, you know, okay, well, why? And Travis, he did lie to her. He told her that he owed uh, one of his friends who was in the business a favor. His friend wanted to bring along his wife, but they didn't have anybody to watch the kids. So they would have to bring the kids with them. And what they wanted to do was also bring along a babysitter. So they had somebody who could watch the kids for them. So essentially he's giving this ticket to this babysitter to repay his friend. So Jody's like, okay, yeah, well, I guess that's better than bringing a girl. So that was the story that Jody got. Travis and Jody still keep in touch. And during one of their phone calls, Jody decides that she's going to record it. And it's, I can't even comfortably listen to the portion that's allowed to be shown on television. It is racy, X-rated. It's just so, so uncomfortable to listen to. And it does not sound like Travis knew or gave permission for that to happen either. Again, it's such a struggle because you go back to seeing that there were these opportunities for Travis to distance himself from Jody, and he didn't. And I do think that part of it was just the, the comfort of knowing that someone was there that was interested in him. That relationship with Lisa didn't work out. He had been trying to pursue Mimi and she put him in the friend zone. And friends would say that he was really looking back on that relationship that he had had with Lisa and feeling like he really, really messed up and he should have probably done more to try to save it. So he's having a tough go of it and we're not really sure what happened but on May 26th Travis and Jody get in a huge fight and he ends up texting her and in that text he he says she betrayed him. He says she's a sociopath, that she's evil, that she's sick and that she was the worst thing that ever happened in his life. Now that that recording went public, a lot of people speculate that he found out about it somehow and felt really betrayed by her. I don't know if maybe Jody tried to use that as some form of control saying, you know, if you don't do this, I'm gonna share this with the church or Mimi or Lisa or whoever. It sounds like she had that for blackmail and I think he found out about it. Two days after that text from Travis, Jody's grandparents' house got broken into and the only thing that was missing was a pistol that belonged to her grandfather. After that text with Jody, Travis finally ended up talking to Lisa and he, you know, just kind of laid it all out there and he said, you know, at least I'd like to be able to see each other at church or in a social setting and it not be awkward. I'd love to be in your life even if it's just at you know, the capacity of being your friend. And so Travis's friend said that Lisa agreed to, you know, slowly try to work to rebuild their relationship as friends. And then his friend said that that really, you know, kind of rejuvenated a little bit more pep in his step. And I think he was really hopeful that maybe something could happen from there. Back in Wairika, again, yes, Wairika. Oh, see, Wairika, no. Jody is planning a road trip and she wants to go and visit her new guy Ryan and they've decided that they will meet up at his house and then there is a prepaid legal seminar that they're gonna go and check out together so she starts planning for that and on June 2nd she goes to visit her brother in Redding California on her way to do this road trip and so once she gets there she decides she wants to get a rental car for the remainder of her trip so she goes to the budget rent-a-center there and she asks to rent a vehicle. The one that they originally give her is this bright red car and Jody just takes the keys, goes back to the counter and she's like, I don't want that. I think it's too flashy. I just want something that's just very neutral and not so loud on the road. So the manager goes and he gets her a white Ford Focus and she's like, yep, perfect. This will do. From there, she goes to meet up with her ex-boyfriend, Matt, who I mentioned at the beginning of this story. She spends the night there and he lives in in Santa Cruz. And then in the morning from there, she decides to go visit her other ex-boyfriend, Daryl, and his son. She gets there and she has breakfast with them, catches up on old times. And then she asks Daryl if she can borrow a couple gas cans. She just says, I'm just taking like a really long trip and you know, I'm by myself in case something happens. I just want to make sure I'm prepared and I've got some gas. So Daryl's like, yeah, 
for sure, here you go. Gives her two gas cans. And then we know at 12.57 p.m. she calls Travis. Again, at 1.51 p.m. phone records show that she calls Travis again. And then after that, she speaks with Ryan and she lets him know that she's on the road and she's gonna pull an all-nighter so she'll see him in the morning around 11 a.m. And then the last activity that Jody has on her phone on that day is at 8.42 p.m. and she just shuts the phone off. On June 4th, we know that Travis woke up in the morning and saw his roommates in the kitchen. He had mentioned to them that he was really tired and that he didn't get a lot of sleep the night before, so he was going to go for a nap. And then later on, he had a conference call that he had to be on. Five days go by and Travis's roommates haven't seen him. They themselves keep crossing paths, kind of being, you know, how's it going? Hey, have you seen Travis? They're thinking it's a little bit weird because Travis has a dog. His name's Napoleon and Travis really loves this dog. They're noticing that he's not been fed or taken out. They remember that Travis had this trip to Cancun. None of them remember the dates that he's supposed to go to Cancun, but they knew it was close. So they thought maybe this was the time and that maybe Travis had just kind of forgot to say, do you mind, you know, letting Napoleon out to go to the bathroom? You know, hold down the fort while I'm gone. See you later. They had texted him a couple times, didn't hear back. One of his roommates called because he needed to know where the mailbox key was and hadn't heard from him. So they're becoming a little bit suspicious, but not letting themselves go to something sinister happening and just chalking it up to miscommunication and the fact that he's probably just in Mexico. Meanwhile, Mimi's also been trying to get a hold of Travis because she's the one who's going to Mexico with him and she also hasn't heard from him and she's got no idea what the game plan is. She doesn't know how they're getting to the airport. What's he packing? You know, all the things the girls the girl needs to know. It's the day before they're leaving and she's really worried at this point. Originally, she was a little bit frustrated that she thought he was kind of playing hard to get, like he didn't care. But as the days grow, grew closer to the actual date, she was thinking more like something's up. She contacts mutual friends of theirs, wondering if they had heard from him and they all kind of start calling within their circle and no one had talked to Travis. So they know something's going on. They actually go to Travis's house. One of their friends has the garage code, so they let themselves in and they hear music coming out of one of the bedrooms and it's one of Travis's roommates. So they knock on the door and he's actually home and they're like, hey, where's Travis? His car's in the garage, but no one's talked to him. And so his roommate's like, oh, he's, he's in Mexico, I think. And Mimi's there and she's like, nope. Uh, we're supposed to leave tomorrow. We go to Travis's bedroom and the door's locked so no one can get in. Travis's roommate finds an extra key of Travis's to get in his room and when they get inside, there is a huge blood stain on the carpet and as they're leading into the bathroom, they're seeing blood on the wall, blood on the floor, blood by the sink and they eventually find Travis's body in his shower. They call 911 and as the operator's kind of probing, she asks, you know, who might have done this? Right away, they say he has a girlfriend that hasn't been leaving him alone lately and she's really scary. Her name's Jody Arias. Meanwhile, Jody's already back at home. She's already done her road trip. She went and saw Ryan. They ended up having dinner, going to their seminar, and then at about 1 a.m. she ended up driving back home. Ryan said there wasn't really any red flags as far as he knew. The There was a couple of suspicious things. Jody originally said that she was going to arrive to see him the morning after they had spoken and she actually didn't arrive until a day later. The excuse she gave him was that she had taken a wrong turn and traveled 100 miles in the opposite direction. And of course, her cell phone died and she couldn't find the charger. So just to regroup, she ended up pulling over and sleeping on the highway. And then when she woke up, she suddenly found the charger. All was right again. He also said that when she arrived, she had dark hair. And when she met him and for years prior, she was always a blonde. And then when they went out to have dinner, he also noticed on her vehicle, the license plate was screwed in upside down. So little things that you probably wouldn't be like, oh, something catastrophic has happened right now. It's just things that he made note of. When detectives get to Travis's house, everybody that they're encountering is basically saying, you need to call Jody right now. She's gotta be involved somehow. And it's almost like a movie playing out. Like the detectives are there, they have Jody's name written down and all of a sudden they get a call from her. She says she just heard that something might've happened to Travis and she was really 
close to him. So she thought, you know, if she could reach out and help any way she could, she would, but that they hadn't really seen each other in months. So she didn't know what help she could be. Detectives are in Travis's house and they're combing through all of their evidence and they get to Travis's laundry room and inside the washing machine, they find a camera. And when they try to turn it on, it's just completely destroyed and damaged, but it's got a memory card inside of it. When they go to look at the memory card, it's wiped. But of course, you know, if you watch CSI, there's going to be that moment where you're like, we can recover this. So they keep the memory card and they send it to forensics to try and pull some of the data that was wiped off. This doesn't happen overnight. You know, over the next few days, they're continuing their investigation. Jody is all over social media, you know, mourning the loss of Travis, writing all of these posts to remember him by. She's contacting his friends and family. And this girl even takes it so far as to send irises to his grandmother. And in the note to his grandma, she writes, Travis always said that if he had a girl, he would name her Iris. And if I have a little boy, I'm gonna name him Alexander. What the f She's psychotic. She is out of her mind psychotic. She even contacts Travis's bishop and she starts asking questions about Mimi. The bishop's kind of taken back and he's like, why Why are you caring so much about Mimi? She wasn't interested in Travis at all. Like they, they were nothing. He said that Jody was a little bit shocked. Like, oh, I thought they were like gonna be together and get married. And the bishop's like, no. And then Jody asks the bishop if he thinks it's a good idea that she contact Mimi and let her know about the physical relationship that she had with Travis. The bishop's like, what would that do? Why is that at all necessary? I think it's because she just wanted people to know that Travis wasn't a perfect Mormon. I don't know if she knew that Travis was interested in Mimi that way and she just kind of wanted to ruin whatever image Mimi had of him being a good guy. That's the only thing that can make sense to me. On June 16th, uh, Travis's memorial is held and despite suspicion of Jody, she ends up showing up like, that's not at all shocking that she would just show up like that. Her level of crazy is just, I don't even know if it's attainable for anybody. While she's there, the detectives ask if she's willing to come down to the station and have a chat. She just says that since her name has been thrown around, she had spoken with some friends and they just advised her that she just keep quiet and not go to the station to talk. 10 days after the memory card was found, they were able to retrieve the photos that were on there. And the photos are quite explicit. They are naked photos of Travis and Jody, And like with any photo in your camera, all of these photos are also date and time stamped. So they're able to see that Jody was at Travis's house the last day that anybody spoke with him. And as they move further on into the camera reel, they're able to see what end up being Travis's last moments of his life. The last photo of Travis, he's looking directly at the camera. And a couple minutes after that, it looks to be a series of photos taken that just started going off amongst a commotion can kind of make out a photo of Travis's back with some blood on it and it looks like somebody dragging him and you can see a part of their pant leg and their foot. Time frame between that initial photo in the shower to the very last one that was taken is a span of 11 minutes. So now detectives know obviously Jody was there. Again, before they can move in on her, she calls them and she says she regrets not speaking to them the other day. And then she gives her account of what happened on what would have been Travis's last day. So she shares that that she went to see her brother, saw Matt after that, then Daryl, then got lost, then went to see Ryan. Detectives now have a date and time of her obviously going to see Travis within that time that she's saying she got lost. Last piece of evidence that the detectives needed to hone in on Jody is that in Travis's bedroom, there was a bloody handprint on the wall and within that is a mixture of Travis's blood and Jody's blood. So now they know that within this attack, she was there. So she couldn't say she was there earlier on and then left and can't be sure of what happened. They know she was there. They go and arrest Jody and she's still denying everything. They show her the pictures and she's like, oh, are you sure that's from then? We did take those, but not, not on that day. And the detective's not buying it. They just keep going back and forth with evidence right in front of her. She is not budging. This is the interview where you see she starts singing Amazing Grace in there by herself. She starts doing handstands. When the detectives say they're gonna book her and they need to take her mugshot, she asks if she can do her makeup. So Jody spends the first night in jail and she wakes up the next day and she decides she wants to talk to detectives again. This time she says that she 
did end up going to Travis's house. She got there around 4 a.m. she said, and that she was really tired, so they just ended up going to bed. He woke up pretty early, went down and saw his roommates. She said they got busy, they experimented with some ropes, then they ended up having a nap. She said they woke up, they took those pictures of each other, and then Travis wanted to go to his office and upload the photos, but there was a virus on his computer so it wasn't working, so he ended up getting frustrated. They ended up getting busy again. Went back to the bedroom. He went to have a shower, and then she said all of a sudden while he was in the shower, all hell broke loose, and these two masked intruders that looked like ninjas broke in and started attacking Travis. She says that they tried to shoot her in the head, but the gun didn't go off, so she grabbed her things and left, and before she left, she said Travis was still alive, and she kept begging him to get up and run away, but he couldn't at that point, and he just told her to leave. She said that these intruders told her that if she told anybody, they would come back and kill her because they saw her address on her license, and so she said she just ran for her life and just wanted to forget that that actually even happened, and so she didn't tell anybody. The detective obviously doesn't believe this and prosecutors decide that based on the evidence and the brutality of what happened to Travis they were going to try Jody for first degree murder. With the first degree charge they had an opportunity to put death penalty on the table and that's really what they were going for. Originally the trial was supposed to take place in 2010 but it doesn't actually end up getting underway until 2013 and a lot of that is just based on Jody's behavior. She just needs to try to manipulate and control every single situation. Her lawyers were not not comfortable representing her. She apparently was very high maintenance, would call all the time, try to control the way that they were preparing their defense, and it was just becoming an absolute nightmare. So when one of their trial dates was approaching, Jody decided that she wanted to represent herself. She felt like she could do a better job than her appointed lawyers. And so by doing this, it completely delayed everything. Automatically, a new date was set. And then within a couple days, Jody ends up going back to the judge and saying, okay, I'm in over my head, I changed my mind. And since everything had already been prepared behind the scenes, it was too late for Jody's lawyers to be reassigned. While they're waiting for trial, she finally does admit to her lawyers that the ninja story is fake. And then she comes up with just the most disgusting thing she's ever done. Besides taking Travis's life, she tries to destroy his reputation. She ends up recounting pretty much that entire day as she already had. But she said at that moment in the shower, what ended up happening was she took a photo of him in the shower and then she dropped his camera and she said he became so enraged by this that he ended up body slamming her to the ground and attacking her and that she felt scared for her life. She said she remembered that when she used to clean his house, she ended up seeing that he had a gun in his closet. She said she was able to wriggle free from him and go to the closet. She grabbed the gun and she shot him. She said that she didn't feel like she had any other choice because throughout their relationship and time together, Travis had turned sexually and physically abusive to her and she thought this attack was gonna be the one that killed her. Jody's attorneys end up trying to avoid this case going to trial. They approach the prosecutor and say, we're willing to make a plea deal for second degree murder. And we think it's in Travis's family and friends best interest if you guys take this because a lot of things are gonna come to light at the trial that are gonna paint Travis in a very negative light. It's going to ruin his reputation within the church. And there's things that are gonna come out that his family is not gonna wanna see. But Travis's family and the prosecutor decide they're not going to take the deal. They want to go for the death penalty, so they turn it down. Then, as it always seems to happen when somebody's involved in Jody's life, Jody's defense attorney receives an anonymous email. Within the email is a copy of a letter. This letter was allegedly written by Travis, and in it, it's basically an admission that he had been abusive to Jody, and not only that, but that he also had pedophilia urges. This letter was sent to a professional analysis. It was proven that that it was a forgery. Before Travis had died, a few of his journals had gone missing. So it looked like somebody took these journals and cut out words that he had written and pasted them to make a sentence. Since this was a photocopy, it wasn't allowed to be presented as evidence. When experts are able to testify, they're able to prove just piecing things together that Travis was never shot first. From what they could tell, he was actually stabbed in the 
heart first. And then it looked just based on the blood evidence that he ended up going to his sink, probably in shock and to see what the heck happened and how he could contain this wound. And then he was repeatedly stabbed in the back. The evidence showed that he tried to crawl away and eventually when he arrived where his bedroom started from his bathroom, he just collapsed there. And then it was at that point where he was shot. And then to make matters worse, his throat was cut from ear to ear, almost decapitating him. It showed that she had absolutely no mercy. She was relentless on him. I mean, he was stabbed 27 times. Even with the defense that they tried to have saying that he attacked her and she was scared of him, basically they did anything they could to just make Travis look like this sex crazed, perverted lunatic and that Jody was just this innocent victim. They even tried to say that he was the really controlling one. There's a photo that they presented where Jody's wearing a shirt and on it it says Travis Alexander's and she said that he basically forced her to wear this as his property. But what they don't show is on the the back of the t-shirt it says blog to being better so it was a marketing strategy that he was using to promote his blog and she just took it and completely twisted it to make it look like she was just this battered victim of Travis's. She ends up wanting to testify at the trial and that's not shocking she's such a narcissist and such a sociopath that I really do think that she thought she could manipulate her way out of it because she just manipulated her way out of everything in life and so she just basically still rolls with she's a victim here of domestic abuse. Although they weren't able to present this forged letter of Travis being a pedophile in, into trial, Jody was bound and determined to use that story and paint him in just such a horrendous light. So what she did was she said there was a time that Travis had attacked her and it was because she walked in on him in his bedroom and he was on his bed. And all of a sudden, as he was trying to cover himself up, a picture flies across the bedroom and lands at her feet. And when she looks at it, it's a photo of a little boy. For the record, there has never ever been a photo found like that. There has never been anything inappropriate regarding children on Travis's email computer, phone, nothing. There's absolutely zero evidence to back this claim up. When it comes time to talk about the attack and get the details that everybody is wanting her to admit, she says that she just blacks out. She says that that the experts are wrong, that she did shoot him first. I just think that that makes things easy for her to stick to a story for her because she doesn't want to remember the attack that she actually did that was so physical and close. I mean, it doesn't make it better by any means to shoot somebody to take their life but when you stab somebody that is very very close and that is personal and I can only imagine if she did that 27 times and then cut his throat I mean it's just obvious that she did not want to recall any of that detail she really tried to paint herself as this sweet innocent victim but really aside from the things that she said about him it's just her actions and just her in general that just show that she's just purely evil that's all it comes down to and then manipulation just it just creeps me out even in her trial, there was points where Travis's family would come to court and they would wear blue ribbons in support of Travis. And when other supporters started coming to trial and wearing the ribbons, she would ask the judge to have those people removed or have them remove their ribbons because she didn't want anybody in there wearing signs that they were supporting Travis and not her. She also placed restraining orders against three journalists who didn't care for her in the trial. She's just, she's just, she scares the shit out of me. Testimony went on for four months. The jury deliberated for three days and found her guilty of first degree murder. But when it came to the penalty phase, they were having a really tough time all unanimously deciding on a death sentence. So it was a hung jury. If it was a hung jury, there was another chance for another jury to hear all of the evidence and then they could decide and that ended up coming back hung again. So ultimately it was a judge who decided that Jody would spend the rest of her life in prison without the possibility of parole. Just last month actually in March 2020, Jody was up for appeal and her new lawyers argued that she didn't receive a fair sentence based on prosecutor misconduct and media coverage. And so it was a three member panel and they came back and they said, although they didn't agree with 
with some of the actions and the delivery of the prosecutor, Juan Martinez, they did agree that Jody was convicted based on substantial amount of evidence and not based on somebody's behavior. So as of 2020, Jody is still in jail. Her lawyer, Kirk Nurmi, he actually has been disbarred. I think he actually forfeited his law license and that's because he ended up writing a tell-all book about what it was like to represent Jodi Arias. And the title of it is Trapped with Miss Arias. There's a lot of mixed reviews on it though. I know that he received a lot of heat for representing her in the first place. And then now people think that he comes across very narcissistic. I haven't read it personally, but very, very mixed reviews. In all of this though, I just feel so, so bad for Travis. It drives me crazy to see that there are people out there who defend what Jodi did based on the way that Travis treated her. Like I said at the beginning, I don't don't agree with the fact that he obviously used Jody for sex. Nobody wants to be used in that way and feel that way, but he had a really caring heart and I don't think that there was ever a point where he was physically or mentally abusive to her. His intentions were always very obvious. He never said to her, hey, if you come over, I'm going to marry you. He was very open with what the premise of that relationship was, so it was also on her to agree to do it time and time again. I don't think we're ever going to know what the defining moment was for her that absolutely made her snap. Some people think it's that last entry that he wrote and then a lot of people also speculate that it's because she found out that he was bringing Mimi to Cancun and she didn't want that relationship to progress. We'll never know though because Jody's the only person who can tell us and I think at this point she just believes her own lies. I mean, she's taken it so far to the point where she's made t-shirts for domestic abuse survivors that say survivor on it. She's, yeah, she just, she's that's the only thing that, you, that's the only way that you can explain it really. But I wanna know what you guys think. Do you think this is because of the blog or Mimi? I think Mimi, just based on that conversation she had with his bishop, constantly asking questions about Mimi, I think at that point when he said there was absolutely nothing and she was taken back a bit, I don't know if she thought, oh, Wow, got that very, very wrong. I just think there's something there. But let me know your guys' thoughts. You know I love to hear from you in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video. Until then, stay safe, kids. Love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.